your daily fix of women's mixed martial arts from the UFC, Invicta FC, Bellator, and one championship. Be in the loop because Golden State Media Concepts got you covered. Get your fix on women's MMA with Got You Covered on Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC Women's MMA Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Arnel DeLeon, and hopefully you are doing well for yourself. You, your friends, your family, whether you live in the States or internationally, I hope you're doing fine for yourself during a time of major uncertainty. The year of 2020 has been very, very rocky, but as we are nearing the end of 2020, Sports is being a wee bit normalized. Actually, I live here in Orange County, and Orange County right now, we are currently going through. I don't know what's going on with your respective states or your respective city or counties, but at the very least in Orange County, we are redoing, re-re again, phase two reopening, which means we got restaurants reopening up, we got uh, stores reopening up now. It's becoming a much less restrictive as it pertains to going to stores with, uh, with, um, with mouth masks now. Yes, you, if you go to, if you go to your Target or to your Walmart or to your Smart Finals, you still have to wear the mouth guard to go and, you know, protect yourself. The salt, the social distancing, six feet away thing, that's still happening, but it's becoming much more or less lenient now. It feels really good hanging out with friends and taking them out to restaurants. It feels really good uh, doing that all over again. But you know what? Yeah, things are coming down to a close, although things are getting incredibly rocky. We can expect sports to be really normalized. Actually, speaking of sports, Last night was the Toronto Raptors Boston Celtics game, and me being a huge basketball nerd, it's like I have two passions. I love basketball, and I love mixed martial arts. They're my two favorite sports out there to watch. And pretty much, the the fan experience of okay, the experience of seeing fans going loud or going crazy and cheering and all stuff, it's not as prevalent, or it isn't as. It doesn't really weigh down on the actual game itself because last night, man, Raptors, Celtics, great game. Even though they were dealing with a virtual audience, I don't think there will be a virtual audience for UFCs or, you know, yeah, I just can't imagine it. I just don't know where you'd place a virtual audience in like around an octagon. Yeah, I just don't see it really happening. But I'll be talking about the recent UFC Fight Night event, which was UFC Fight Night, Alistair Overeem against Augusto Sakai. A night, especially, there were multiple fights pulling out of this, and it makes sense. This isn't the first time, it's not going to be the last time, where we saw, it was an entire fight night. Here's the thing, it was a fight night card that was 3 hours and 50 minutes long. But in this 3 hour and 50 minute long um, fight show, we had... 70 minutes of actual total runtime action. 70 minutes. Three hours. It's almost a 40 hour show and we had 70 minutes. It's wow. I, I don't know anything about that. I don't. And I do know in the recent major UFC pay per view, the runtime of the actual show, of the actual, like, of fighting, of in ring, I mean, in the octagon, people scrapping, people actually fighting, took about 30 minutes, 30% of the, uh, a lot of time. Like, we got the commercials, we got the advertising, we got the people doing the walkouts, we got the introductions, we got the announcements going on, we got commentators uh, talking to the camera. The fighting only took part, only took 30% of the actual runtime. And in this show, when it was 70 minutes out of a potential four hours, yikes. Just around 25%. It's 25% of the show. Well, we'll say 27% of the show had actual fighting. I would love to see it. I'd love to see where I can watch an MMA event and it doesn't feel like I have to wait eternity for fights to happen. But that's just how they are. And you, have to accept, and you just have to accept it, really enough. What we're talking about here, Vivian Arujo versus Montana De La Rosa. The fight stats here shock me. They really do. Alright then, so Vivian Arujo was able to defeat Montana De La Rosa via unanimous decision. But I'm looking at the fight stats here and they are so close that upon looking at the actual stats versus what I saw on the monitor, on my monitor watching the show, they tell two different fights. So I'll just go by the fight stats here. Fight stats say Vivian Arujo 
landed 91 out of 150 total strikes, 61%. Significant strikes, 82 out of 140, 59%. Alright, 61, 59. Now, Montana Del Rosa, 88 out of 220. She's only three shots shy of landing her total strikes while attempting 70 more. That's 40. 40 total strike percentages. I have 40% in total strike percentage. And then for significant strikes, Montana De Rosa landed 85 out of 215. She landed three more significant strikes than Vivian Arujo. And then she had a takedown also. She's, she's one of six in takedowns compared to Vivian Arujo's 0 of 1. So if you're just go by the pure fight stats here, one would say, oh wow, this is a close fight. Really, it wasn't a close fight. It really isn't. One of the difficulties of being a judge, I know a lot of us like, like, enjoy making fun of the judges. Uh, I've talked about it in this podcast a lot, where there are some fights where I generally believe fighter A should have won over fighter B. There were some scenarios where I look at the judges scorecards and I'm like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. That makes no sense. How the heck can that fighter win that fight? And <laughs> actually, the next UFC fight in events, which has Angela Hill versus Michelle Watterson, both those fighters arguably should have won their respective fights here. Like, Angel Hill should have defeated Claudia Cadella and Michelle Watterson should have defeated Carlos Esparza. But you know what? Vivian Ruhu versus Montana De Rosa, let me tell you what I saw. I saw Vivian Arujo pressing the action on Montana De La Rosa and she's just picking apart her. I don't know. So Montana De La Rosa, what I think happened when I saw this fight was that Dela Rosa was pulling off many counter punches. She was pulling off many counter punches and she was really focusing on towards the jab for Vivian Rujo. Because what happened here was Vivian Rujo, she's pressing the action. Montana De Rosa, majority of this fight was walking backwards. It was Vivian Rujo going on the offense all the time. And although Dela Rosa, she had this weird combination of having a high volume of counter strikes and really enough higher, more significant strikes. But I watched the actual fight. I'm looking at it. And if you're to look at the faces, if you're just like, if you're just look at the faces of both of these fighters, and you're just looking at how these fighters react to the significant strikes, it's hard for anyone to convince me that Vivian Arujo's significant strikes did not matter as much as Montana de Rosa's. Because here's the thing, Montana de Rosa, her jet, okay, so, okay, I don't go to Montana de Rosa here, so, Rue is pressing the action, Montana de Rosa, despite the fact that she has about a 3 inch advantage, with a much more greater reach than Vivian Arujo, what Montana de Rosa was doing, was that she was very tight, in her form and her stances, her legs weren't all that spread apart all that much, it was very closed in, and so the gap between her and Vivian Arujo was not that significant enough for Montana de Rosa to go take advantage of her reach advantage. It never looked like Montana de Rosa was ever taking advantage of her reach and of her size. It just didn't feel like that. It felt like Arujo was pressing the action, and because... Here's the thing. Arujo was the one who's pelting Montana de Rosa with a whole lot of jabs and a whole lot of hooks. It looked like de Rosa was only comfortable when she was fighting inside the pocket and doing these short and doing these short strikes. But it didn't look good. Oh man, it's just so confusing. I just don't get what Montana de Rosa's strategy was. I just don't get it because if de La Rosa, if de La Rosa is the type of fighter who prefers fighting inside the pocket, then why is it? And then almost every exchange, Vivian Rujo is like landing the better shots. She really is. I guess it's also a matter of, well, it, well, what matters more? Uh, two, two clean jabs to the face. Or one really good looking hooking shot, hook punch, or one really good looking uppercut. What do you score more? What matters more? Because Montana de Rosa, like, Aruro will press the action, she's gonna go for a three punch combination, then Della Rosa is gonna go start swinging a four punch combination, she's gonna land a couple of those, but then Vivian Rujo lands his really sick looking hook or uppercut or counter punch, and then Montana de Rosa is all days, and next thing you know, she's in the cage. But statistically speaking, De La Rosa won in that exchange. Yes, Vivian Rujo is the one who not, who dazed Montana de Rosa multiple times 
in the first and second round. Third round close. First, second round, without a doubt, Arujo won those first two rounds. But you can't tell me that all because De La Rosa landed a better flurry of shots in her counter punches on Vivian Arujo in terms of sheer volume and accumulation of total strikes doesn't mean that they should be rewarded the same way Vivian Arujo has when she lands a really hard looking punch. So it's like if you have a if you have a ten year old kid and the ten year old kid were to punch me in the face like fifteen, twenty times and then I just smacked him once. That one smack mattered more than his fifteen, twenty punches. That's just what happens. I don't know. Uh, it's just, oh man, F- fight stats always, they always confuse me. And I always, I'm just like, cause I would really be upset actually. That's the thing. I would really be upset if even Aruho did not win the fight. Because it felt like the way, with the way how the fight was going, it looked like it was the fight was going perfectly well for Vivian. And I really believe that there was a real possibility that Vivian Ruo might not have won that fight off the basis that you know, the numbers say it. And Montana Rosa can say that. She can be like, you know what? Montana Rosa, I won, she won the fight because the fight stats say so. Nah. Fight stats are just one thing. If the fight is very, very, here's, okay, here's how I view it. If there are two fighters and the fight just off the eye test, is very close and you're not sure who actually is winning per round. If you think like like if you go to like Max Holloway versus Volkan Ozemir, if it's like the second, third round and both fighters are landing these really good shots and you have to second guess yourself and you really gotta think, hmm, who actually won that second round? Who actually won the third round? Hmm. You know what? Then you can go to the fight stats. And then you can and then you can use fight stats as your barometer as to explaining why fighter A or fighter B won the fight. That's how I believe. I think fight stats are perfect as it pertains to judging close fights based off uh, when going off the eye test alone. That's what I believe. But when you're watching the fights and then you're seeing this one woman obviously stagger, pull out the harder, look, harder looking shots, and is the one dictating the pace of the fight, who's the one dictating the action, and is pressing forward all the time, and is making it really uncomfortable for the other fighter, and fighter B just doesn't look good, just doesn't look good. She doesn't, like, her face looks all battered up, she, she, she's always dazed, her combinations isn't as slick, isn't as smooth. Then yeah, fighter A, even though fight stats give a slight, slight edge to Montana Rosa, no, just no. I test the eye test says Vivian Arujo won the fight. And so right now, I'm currently looking at the women's fight division right now. Where does that place Arujo? I think Arujo was two spots higher than Montana De Rosa in their fight. She's about two spots far. So Vivian Arujo, as of right now, is ranked number 10 in the women's fight rankings here. Huh. So yeah, Arujo is ranked number 10 in the rankings. Andrea Lee... There's a lot of stock going on towards Andrea Lee right now, but she'll be fighting against Roxanne McDaffrey. And both fighters are going off a loss. Huh. It's very interesting. Okay, where's Montana Del Rosa right now? I'm trying to try to find Montana Del Rosa within the rankings right now. It's... Where's Montana Del Rosa? I can't really find her. Huh. Strange. Okay, so let's go for Vivian Rujo. So, Vivian Rujo lost to Jessica I. This guy has dropped. She was the number two fighter for the longest time in the fight division. And then she dropped down to number seven. It would make sense. And it's an easy matchup to go do. All right. Vivian Arujo versus Jessica I. Rubber match. I think it's a good matchup for Vivian. I think there's a tough matchup for Jessica I. Even though Jessica I defeated Vivian Arujo in their last matchup. With the way how I has been fighting since her injury. And how Vivian Arujo's performance against Montana De Rosa, I can expect a better version of Vivian Arujo versus Jessica I compared to the first matchup there. And it's because of that, I really believe that I think Vivian Arujo, if possible, would sign a contract for her to fight against Jessica I. I think Jessica I, since she defeated Vivian Arujo, there's a part of her that believes that she has the confidence to go possibly go defeat her again by decision. I can see that as a real possibility for both fighters. And for Montana De Rosa right now, she's 
outside of the top 10. She could fight Alexis Davis. She could fight Macy Barber. There are two fighters she could possibly fight that could help go help her in her stock as she climbs up her way through the uh, UFC Women's Flight Rankings. And so coming up after a short break here, I'll be back here with the news brief right here at the GSMC Women's MMA Podcast. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. And we are back. So I'm discussing Michelle Watterson versus Angel Hill since that is coming up in the next UFC fight event. That event will be coming up Saturday, September 12th at 5 p.m. at the UFC Apex Facility Building. You can watch it on ESPN+. Plus. Michelle Watterson versus Angela Hill. I am very excited for this matchup here because I genuinely believe that Michelle Watterson and Angela Hill both have to be the two most underrated fighters in the women's strike division. I genuinely believe that. I genuinely believe that Michelle Watterson and Angela Hill, in my opinion, can defeat anybody outside the top five of the women's right division. Anybody. I believe... So, Angela Hill right now, she's ranked number 16. She's ranked number 16. And although her UFC record says she's 7 and 8... Wait a minute. I'm looking at her. Yeah, so although her UFC record says she's 7 and 8, and she lost to Claudia Cadella, if you were to just watch the fights between Hill and Claudia Cadella... And this is me going off like the eye test and the fight stats. Okay, so the eye test says, in my viewpoint, Angela Hill defeated Claudia Cadella. And also, I think the fight tests also say that Hill should defeat Claudia Cadella. At least in the first and second round. Third round, Claudia Cadella won. That's how I view it. But Angela Hill, she lost to Claudia Cadella. I genuinely believe she defeated Claudia. We have Michelle Watterson, who lost to Carlos Sparza. I genuinely believe Michelle Watterson should have defeated Carlos Sparza. And I remember I was watching a Chael Sonnen video. You don't have to, like, for Chael Sonnen videos, you don't actually have to take his word as a grain of salt, though. But him and many other people were in agreement in that both these women should have won their respective fights. Both women should have won their respective fights, then. And then the, and I'm looking at the comment section because I, here's, actually, I'm one of the idiots who actually does read up on the YouTube comments because you can't just, you know, block them out. Like, if someone has a viewpoint, you should always be open to, like, looking at, looking into it and be like, hmm, maybe they do have a point. And on the YouTube comments, a lot of them agreed that Waterson and Angel Hill should have won the respective fights. And there was a lot of negativity thrown towards those, both of those women in that both those fighters fought the right way. They fought correctly, but I think, okay, someone put it down there. They fought like champions. And you're not supposed to fight like a champion when you're trying to climb your way up the rankings. 
And that kind of got to me. And I was thinking about it. So, if you are a point system fighter, if you are somebody who is fine transitioning away from being a knockout artist, being somebody who ends their opponents, to being somebody who's just... It's just weird. It's just, it's just such a weird thing we do here in the UFC and how fans feel. It's like, we reward champions for making it to the championship rounds. I just don't get how it works. In that, like, if a challenger is winning first, second, third round, we'll have something like Joe Rogan or something like, or somebody or some fan out there to be like, okay, now we're in the championship rounds, man. These are the rounds that actually mattered. And I'm just like, wait a minute. Are you meaning something that the first three in a championship fights, the first three rounds don't matter? And there are varying different viewpoints about this. And that some of the people say, oh man, to be the champion, you gotta really beat the champion. And I'm like, what do you mean you gotta really beat the champion? Just beat them either through KO, submission, or through the point system. And apparently, if you are a challenger and you're trying to go win through the point system, you're not, you're not good enough to be an elite fighter, but yet you're fighting like a champion and you're not fighting the right way. But if a champion were to do that, it's just, ugh, it's, it's so confusing. And it's so confusing and it always pains me that this always happens. This has happened to John Jones. This has happened to Amanda Nunes. It has happened to Kumaro Usman. Tyron Woodley. This always happens. It feels like once you, be, once you get the belt, you just don't take any risk anymore, and it's understandable as why you don't take any risk. But now it's just this weird hypocrisy that it's expected that a champion isn't meant to really dominate their opponent through a stoppage, but they're meant to dominate their opponent through a decision victory. But challengers cannot dominate their opponent through decision victories. They have to win through, like, a knockout. Or, or, I don't know. It's just so, so bizarre. And the reason why I'm going off on a tangent here was because who was Carlos Barza's last opponent? So okay, let me look up Carlos Barza. So yeah, Carlos Barza versus Marina Rodriguez. Carlos Barza fought a very sloppy, very ugly fight to Marina Rodriguez. If you were to like show me this Carlos Barza versus every other Carlos Barza fight, you'd be like, Carla, I know you're trying to make the fight exciting at all. But oh my goodness, what are you doing? I remembered, I think it was in, I think it was like late in the first round, in that Carlos Barza was aiming for like a single leg key lock for no real reason. Like she had, like she had top position, she was ground controlling her opponent, doing ground and pound, and it was obvious that Carlos Barza, okay, so Carlos Barza, she's never really gonna ground and pound you and win. It's more of a sense she's just gonna press you on the floor and she's gonna win via points. That's just how every Carlos Barza fight is, alright? Whether you like, whether you like, whether or not you like Carlos Barza's fighting style, and there are a lot of people who don't like watching Carlos Barza because of the fighting style, she's fighting the right way. Okay? Is it, can it be, can it be really boring? Can it be very predictable? Can it be like, be, <laughs> seeing Carlos Barza fights are like watching Metapod fights. You're not going to enjoy it. But Metapod has to do Harden. <laughs> Alright then? Metapod can't do anything else. He has to do Harden, whether he likes to or not. Because that's the only thing he's really good at. Alright then? And Carlos Barza the striking, although she's made some strides to it, she's a better striker now than she was two and a half years ago. Okay. But Carlos Barza, she's a grappler, wrestler first. Winning through ground and pound, winning through ground control. And she attempted this random single leg key lock when she really shouldn't have, which led to Marina Marina Rodriguez countering her, getting on top position, and raining down some really hard shots onto Carla. It looked really bad. It looked really dead. And so, but Carla Sparza, in the post fight interview, according to her, she said that she was pressured into fighting this style. This like fight, this aggro, super aggro. Very aggressive fighting style where she's placing herself in the worst position, making bad decision making skills just so she can climb up in the rankings. That's what happened. And let me look at this. Uh, and just not yawn. Uh, where is Claudia right now? I'm not looking. Uh, yeah, it's just like I'm just like. <laughs> 
uh, it's it gets confusing. It gets very confusing how this works. And so back to Angel Hill and Michelle Watterson. If they want to, both of these women can easily pull out the best fight of the night. I'm not even arguing against that. There's a real possibility that these two women, it might be three rounds, it might be five rounds, we're still unsure about that. We do know the original main event was going to be a five round fight and they got moved over into becoming a three round fight. But their card is coming up a full month from now. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's Diago Santos versus somebody, uh, versus Glover Shera. I think it's Diago Santos versus Glover Shera. Their fight was gonna be a five round light heavy main event. And then they got moved over to next month's UFC fight and events. And their fight will no longer be a five round fight. It's not gonna be a three round fight. And I think this is going to be a three round fight between Angel Hill and Michelle Watterson. It only makes the most sense. That's how I, how, how I view it. It makes the very most sense that these two are going to compete for a 300. Now, both these women can definitely compete at a five-round. I know Michelle Watterson can definitely compete at a five-round fight at a five-round level and championship level. But I'm not sure what the result, what uh the exact... I'm not sure what's going to happen here between these two. I really don't. Because there's so much that can go right for this fight, but at the same time, so much can go wrong here in the sense that... Okay, you know what? Never mind. Because both these fighters have the tendency of fighting super passively. Both do. Okay, so the Vegas prediction odds are already out then. Oh my gosh. I predict... Michelle Watterson winning the fight. Because of her reach advantage. And she's a... Michelle Watterson is much more of a dynamic striker than Angela Hill. She's had a lot more weapons and a lot more options to go and defeat Hill. But the problem with Michelle Watterson, most of the time, pertains that she doesn't necessarily excel in any specific category, and so she's like a 7 out of 10 in what she can do. So she's like a 7 out of 10 striker, a 7 out of 10 grappler. She doesn't excel all that well, and because of that, considering how Angela Hill fights, her like no fear mentality and always her pressing the action, I could see it where Michelle Watterson is like pulling off her combinations, but Angela Hill just eating it. And depending on how it looks, one might say, well, Angela Hill, she's taking all these shots, so Watterson's winning this. Or you might say, well, Hill's taking all these shots, but she's obviously the one pulling out some real knockout power onto Watterson. And I don't expect these two women to finish her opponent off by a knockout. I just don't see it. I think Watterson versus Hill will end via decision. And if Watterson comes into the fight with the right strategy, she should defeat Angela Hill. She should. So we're now looking, like, Glover Shara, sorry, Glover Shara, that guy, Michelle Watson takes center stage at the UFC facility. This is coming in by SB Nation, MMAmania.com. We got Frank Metra, Brian, oh, Fr- Brian Barbera against Anthony Ivy. That'd be, it'd be a really, really fun one here. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to look here. What are people's general predictions of this fight? So, yeah, currently right now, there doesn't seem to be that many predictions or previews coming up for Hill Watterson from MMA Mania. <laughs> this re- just 16 hours ago, they posted, in, in order to hype up the fight between Watterson and Hill, they just showed Michelle Watterson t- t- choking out uh, Paige Van Zandt. I remember that fight. A lot of hype came into Paige Vanzant, which is so ironic because Paige Vanzant just got off her UFC contract and now she's competing for BKFC, Bare Knuckle Fighting Championships. And I'm constantly seeing BKF, BKFC advertisements popping up whenever I look up any MMA news. But yeah, man, I don't know. I think they're doing Paige Vanzant kind of dirty there. <laughs> they do. It's like, hey, people, get hyped up. For Watterson versus Hill, you know why? Because remember that one other fight that got really hyped up? Here's a free video of her getting choked out by one of the two fighters there. Yeah. <laughs> I just, it's strange. It's very, very strange here. Um, so, uh, predictions coming up. I'm trying to find here. Was about Robert, Alan Patrick versus Bobby Green. Oh wow, Bobby Green has been interesting. We also have, oh man, Julia Villa versus Ciara Eubanks. Hmm. 
Actually, I didn't know, I didn't know CR Yavax would be competing against Avila here. Wow. Uh, this spot, this spot thought this easily is going to be the toughest challenge for both women here. Yeah, clearly for now, I can't really find much predictions going in into this fight. But yeah, I'm going back to, I'm predicting Watterson should defeat Angela Hill. But this definitely will be a scrap fight. I don't think Watterson can get away with how she fought against Carlos Esparza, with how she fought against someone like Angela Hill. Because in that fight, it was Watterson being in the aggressive, but fighting very safe and passive. And with that, how Angela Hill fights, and that she fights very, like, Angela fights like a, like a boxer. Like, that's her fight's like very basic, fundamental based boxer, versus, uh, Michelle Watterson's karate style. And I can go see, if Michelle Watson is smart, will constantly aim for those leg kicks. She's gonna go and be able to duck under shield to move. I think she is quick enough and good enough as a striker with a, a good enough fight IQ that she can go handle the pressure of Angela Hill and she can duck under and land in some good accumulatory volume strikes. All she has to do is avoid those short bursts that Angela Hill can do, similar to Carlos Barza did to go win out in her matchup against Michelle Watterson. And that if she can survive those short bursts of Angela Hill, being a scrap fighter in going in taking the risks, I think Watterson should win this fight. But then again, I can be completely wrong. For all I know, Hill can be the pressure fighter, makes Angela Hill super uncomfortable. I mean, can make Watson super uncomfortable. And Watson can come into the fight with a bad strategy, fighting very passive, not really doing much because that was a huge criticism for her in her last fight. That can really happen. It can. And so coming up after the short break here, I'll be going back here with the news brief right here. The GSMC Women's MMA Podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. Welcome to the news brief. And so I'll be discussing two former UFC fighters here in Liz Kamuchi and Kat Zingano who are taking the next step in their careers as fighters for Bellator. So what is going on with the both of them right now? So this is coming in by MMAfighter.com. Bellator 246 video. We have an interview with Liz Kamuchi explaining her weird changes at UFC that led to her exit. So a veteran Liz Kamuchi is ready to take a, uh, to make a splash in her new promotion home at Bellator after a series of weird changes with UFC ownership spelled the end of her octagon tenure. Kamuchi, a one-time UFC bantamweight title challenger, felt a shift in the promotion was acquired in 2016 by entertainment giant uh, WME, resulting in a series of interactions that made her feel unwelcome. When a pink slip came during the PR gig, Kamuchi was in some ways shocked and in other ways not at all. When the new ownership took over... There were just a lot of changes that were just really weird to me and didn't make sense. She said at a virtual media uh, media call for her debut against Deanna Bennett for Saturday's Bellator 246, which takes place at the Morgan Sun Arena in Connecticut. People getting opportunities for fights that a lot of people felt didn't like deserve it. So those kind of things made it really questionable who was actually going to be able to stay in the organization. Things deteriorated further. Kamuchi said after a disastrous title rematch against Valentin Trichinko, she indicated that promotion both strung her along and strong, uh, strong-armed her after a lopsided loss to the champ 
at UFC Uruguay back in August 2019. I kept asking for fights, saying I'm ready, and we get like, don't worry, you'll get something, but not giving me phone calls back. Weird to me that I had opportunities where I was injured and I was told I had to take, I had to go take fight or I'd be blacklisted, but then other girls would say no to, no to me at every opportunity and every turn was another thing that was okay. That's not really right. Like several other high profile vets, Kimuchi shopped around after a release and wound up signing with Viacom CBS owned as she will make her debut in the same division with her longtime training partner, Ilima Mail McFarlane, but she said they'll have no problem punching each other in the face for a title. So, what do I think about that? Hmm. So, what this Gucci is saying has happened. So, it has happened uh, for other fighters. There have been other fighters after upon not working for the UFC go on on a tangent and on a rant about the idea that some fighters get fights that they don't deserve. You got fighters out there waiting for their opportunity. So, this is coming in by MMAJunkie.com. We have Kat Zingano. Let's talk about her relationship with the UFC. The main title of this headline being Kat Zingano on moving on from UFC to Bellator. Despite good relationship, I got some ultimatums. So, former UFC Bantam Metallic Challenger Kat Zingano makes her promotional debut at Bellator 245 after signing with the promotion last October. Wednesday, Kat Zingano detailed uh, to MMA Junkie. Uh, Kat Zingano, who's 10-4 who's in her MMA career. Friday listed ultimatums involving her Emmy nominated docuseries Why a Fight as one of the reasons that led to a change in promotion. One of the things that I was doing was even just filming that series, there was a little bit of struggle there because ESPN owned the UFC broadcasting rights and I was filming for ESPN. I was kind of getting pulled in different directions as far as what I could do while I was filming as far as fighting. The documentary series meant a lot to me. It's very deep and explains fighters to people in a way I don't think everyone understands. It really was a big project, a big important project. I don't know. I guess there was a little bit of patience issue with me being able to complete that. And then I got some ultimatums. It wasn't the first time I ever got an ultimatum. Despite the ultimatums, Zigano said she did not leave the UFC on her bad terms. Her departure was also a reflection on a booming free agency period and Belter's offer. I kind of reached out and saw what was out there and considered what free agency would be like, Zagano said. It was bright and it was beautiful and there was a lot of opportunities and options. I just felt excited about trying it and maybe trying a new chapter and closing that one. We're good, the UFC and I. Still have a good relationship and rapport. It was right for me to make the move, to make these changes. So far, I'm extremely happy about everything. It's no hurt feelings or anything. It's just I got the option to bite and I bit. I took the chance. I did the shopping, due diligence on finding out what's best for me and my career and my goals, Zingano said. It's just a good vibe to be here. I watch everybody, every fighter, every employee around me is happy. It's low stress and you get to focus. Those are all the things that made me want to start these types of sports in the first place. I go, so with the past rear, uh, Zingano's focus on the future. She sees intriguing matchups on the horizon and likes the prospect of fighting at 145. A weak class she still thinks is good for her. I got up a weight class, which I think is healthy for the longevity for the sports for me. I've done a lot of different weight classes. Going to be a bigger, healthier is something that's just next for me. I like the opponents here. There are some badass women. I'm here to continue the legacy of things that I do and do the way that I do by fighting my fights. Just putting it all together on the stage and actually extremely proud of it. Belter 245 takes place Friday at the Mohegan Sun Arena. Hmm, so... Kat Zingano and Liz Kamuchi. I don't really... Hmm. So, both of them right now... Okay, I'm trying to look at the comments here. <laughs> so, so, Kat Zingano is 1-4 since 2015. The ultimatum was... The ultimatum was to win a fight. You see, I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking about that right now. So, Kat Zingano... She was a big name fighter at one point. What ultimatums would they have? You know what it'd be? It probably is since she's doing a docuseries for ESPN. The ESPN probably is like, okay, you can't, you know, keep the rights to this docuseries. It's ours. He filmed it under our supervision, so it's us. Also, Kat Zingano, you better win your next fights. Because if you're one in five over the span of five years, and there's this expectation of yourself that you should go and get even more opportunities, it should be rewarded, you should get even more money. 
I'm not I'm not on board with that. I really am not. Uh there are a lot of fighters. I think Paige Van Zandt like exemplifies this in the sense that you got fighters like Paige Van Zandt, like Kat Zinganu, and even and to an extent Liz Kamuchi, who believe that they have way more value to an organization than what they're actually what they're, what their actual worth is. I know Paige Benzen is considered like a super is like too many people everybody like man Paige Benzen has superstar qualities about her I don't know what they are I guess it's because she's like a model and she's like really pretty and stuff but like what about her within the sport of mixed martial arts makes her a superstar I'm not really sure I'm just not and then for Gatsangana Liz Kimuji by the tail end of their UFC careers they were pretty much gatekeepers and so I don't understand why, like, so, here, okay, here's how my explanation of what I believe Liz Kamuchi was going through before her release. So, Liz Kamuchi was 10 and 6. So, I'm trying to figure out what Liz Kamuchi's career was. Alright, so let me type a, I want to see what her performances were right before her release. So, I'm trying to look at Liz Kamuchi. So I'm looking at this. So Liz Kamuchi, in her in the past three years, she is two and two. All right. So she was two and two. She lost to Alexis Davis, defeated Jennifer Maya, then got then got stomped by Valentin Shevchenko. And I'll be brutally honest right now, dude. Nobody expected Kamuchi to defeat Valentin Shevchenko. Everyone was expecting Velty Chirico to go win her matchups. And currently so... No, she's like... She's... Liz Kamuchi is in the same tier as Yohan Calderwood and Kylian Chikagian. In the sense that... You're a good fighter. But no one really expects you to actually defeat Valentin Chirico and become the flight champion. It is very unlikely... I believe that Liz Kamuchi would fight Valentinchenko. If both of them were to fight each other 10 times, what's the very likelihood that Kamuchi's going to win a majority of them? Not very likely. I just don't see it right now. Also, I'm going to go look at the flyout rankings here. So, the flyout rankings is a division right now that I always say has to be the weakest among the women's divisions. And... The reason why, and other than the women's featherweight division, but the women's featherweight division, I'm not really counting because that division is pretty much non-existent. All right, so I'm looking at the top echelon of the women's flight rankings here. The two fighters who are most likely to defeat Valentin Shevchenko would be Jennifer Maya and Cynthia Cavallo. Jennifer Maya defeated Yuan Calderwood. So she replaced Yohan Calderwood for being the number one contender to fight against Valentin Shevchenko, and their fight's coming up on November 21st. By the way, poor Yohan, man. She was supposed to fight against Shevchenko. Now that fight got called off. If she just waited two months, then uh, uh, feel bad for her. Really do. But even then, Maya versus Shevchenko, I am not that sold on Jennifer Maya. I really am not. Yes, she had a surprise victory against Yuan Calderwood, though she lost to Kaylin Chukagian, and Shevchenko stomped Chukagian. And so, the way how I see the flight rankings right now in the top echelon, Cynthia Cavallo, who, by the way, will be fighting on October 24, I believe is the only fighter right now who is within the top 10 of the rankings who can defeat Valentin Shevchenko. If Katzingano and Liz Kimuchi were there, I highly doubt either of them would be good enough to defeat Valentin Shevchenko. And then we go down. So we have prospects like, so I know they're really pushing hard on Andrea Lee. They're pushing hard on Macy Barber. They're pushing hard on Jillian Robertson, on people like Amanda Ribas. So yeah, there's like, there's a, <laughs> don't forget, there's Jion Kim. Who, uh, there's Jion Kim who's, although her, like, her stunt in the way, the flyweight, in the flyweight class is kind of iffy on and on again. She's still a prospect. We have Maria Agapova, who is definitely a high tier prospect, although she lost her fight against Shannon Dobson and didn't have a good performance. 
Maria Agapova is, I think, 22 years old. So there's a lot going for her. She and Dobson just defeated a high touted prospect in a really fun showing. I'll love to see Antony Shevchenko against Shane Dobson. And although Antony Shevchenko, she's someone the UFC really wants to push, she'll be fighting against Ariana Lipsky. And Ariana Lipsky right now, she's 1-2 in her UFC career right now, so they're really pushing her. There are a lot of pieces going on right now. It's all, don't forget Alexa Grasso. Alexa Grasso is ranked number 9, despite the fact that she's 1-3. and three. And there's a real possibility why I see Alexa Grasso against Yohan Calderwood. That's my prediction of the next fight coming up. And if Alexa Grasso were to defeat Yohan Calderwood, even though her record isn't all that well, she might slide her way in into the top five. It could really happen. So yeah, the women's fight rankings right now, there's a lot of things happening. And for Katzengano, I don't think Katzengano will make a comeback to the UFC. Alright? I don't really think so. And I believe Katzengano made the right move going to Bellator because there is no way the UFC can offer the money that Katzengano wants because... Whoever is booking the AFC or doing HR will be like, Katz, you really want more money? You really think you're worth this much amount, this much amount? I mean, come on, like, you're not, you're one in five in the past five years. Like, do you really deserve, you know, X amount of money? And the same thing goes for Paige Vincent. Paige Vincent is making well over twice as much money. I think she's making three times. She's making over twice as much, at least twice as much money, maybe three times as much money competing for BKFC. With a lot more opportunities to do other stuff and other and other avenue and other avenues, and she's doing that for BKFC despite the fact that her record in the UFC wasn't all that well. So yeah, if you want, I think you know, Cat, Liz, Paige, they're very smart. They're very very smart, being able to go in and get paid contrary to what their actual performance is until what their actual worth is. So good on them. They're being proper businessmen, businesswomen. I got coming At least you can say she beat two UFC champs, and one of them is the greatest women's champion. Also cool, she was nominated for an Emmy. That's a great resume. Yeah, it's a great. Re- I'm not. I'm not denying it. Katsugano has a great resume. She does. Her pedigree is really good. It just. It isn't. It's not appealing to the mainstream audience. I mean, it is. It isn't appealing to the. To the hardcore audience, who knows that she isn't, she hasn't been that good in the past five years. But if you look at her cumulative career, which is what a lot of fighters use when it pertains to negotiating for their contracts, she has enough leeway to negotiate her way to go a good contract for the Bellator, for a Bellator. Same thing also applies for Liz Camucci. So good for both of them for being able to make a lot of money for what their careers ended up being in the past five years, past three years for Liz Camucci. Did I think those ultimatums? Yes. Do I think there are some fighters who are being given opportunities when they shouldn't? Yes. But that's the fight game. And until the fight game really changes and there's real strides going in by the fighters themselves or if there's a union, we can't really expect to see change for the sports. And so once again, you are listening to the GSMC Women's MMA Podcast coming back with some more news. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. And we are back. So for this past week, I talked about how the year of 2020, uh, for a lot of fighters... A lot of them really pushed towards changes in their careers. We got fighters transitioning from UFC to Bellator to BKFC. We have fighters transitioning into being actors. We got fighters retiring. And we have Beth Korea here. Uh, she releases an emotional statement announcing her UFC retirement fight in December, which is surprising for me. This coming in by MMA Junkie. 
I thought Beth Korea already retired, but it's not really official yet, apparently. So, it is written here by Farah Hanun. Despite recent rumors that she's been cut by the FC, Beth Korea will make the walk to the Octagon one last time. Beth Korea, who is 11-5 in her MMA career, 5-5 in the UFC, posted a message on Instagram to announce that she will deny reports of her UFC release. Instead, she will compete in the final fight of her career at a UFC event in December. And this is coming in from her Instagram. Only a fighter knows the time to stop and follow other paths. Only a fighter and their allies know to tell apart the lies from the truth from what the media puts out. Yes, this will be my last fight and it could not be at any other event than the one and only UFC. Countless lies have been told out there, but I remain centered. I know who I am and I know my story. I have a strong and daring personality that has been the essence of my career and has added many rivalries that strengthened women's MMA. What I leave behind me is my legacy of a fighter who has a bold posture, presentation, and unique celebration style in a fighting world. And personally, that makes many curious to know more about me. It's not by chance that Beth Effect, hashtag Beth Effect is out there. Love me or hate me, in the end, everybody wants to stop and watch me fight. I reached pay-per-view record numbers that back, that back then had not been reached for many years. I have fought the very best and I always made the news. I am certain that I have left my mark and now it's time to let a new generation arise. And I know that I have taught both good and bad lessons. My very last fight will be at the best, uh, will be at the best in the whole world where I dreamed and seek to fight. This December, I will be in the UFC octagon. I will cherish every moment of it and know I'll miss it. I'm incredibly thankful to the UFC for recognition of my career and history. They have never, <laughs> they have never denied me a request. Korea has lost three of her past four fights and is coming off a UNS decision loss to Pani uh, oh, Kenzad in July. In her, uh, in her five UFC wins, Korea has defeated Shayna Baszler, Jessica Ai, and Ciara Eubanks. And it is, let me look up who she's fighting. So she'll be fighting Beth Korea in after retirement fight against Yanan Wu. So Yanan Wu here, so Yanan Wu is one and two since joining the promotion in 2017. What? <laughs> she's been in the UFC for... Okay, she's been in the UFC for three years. She's fought three times. Okay. Let's go with that. Uh, she had a, she had a submission victory over Lauren Muller in the Octagon as competed as both a bantamweight and a flyweight. Alright then, so this should be a gimme fight for Beth Korea? It should be? Then again, Korea's like recent strings haven't all been that good. But you know what? Her and Ricardo Lamas, at least they understand and they accept that winning a fight isn't going to, like, like there's that itch. I think Ricardo Lamas talked about it. And that when you're a fighter, there's an itch if you get a win. And if you lose, there's that itch again of you wanting to end off in your career with a win. It always happens. So, Beth Korea, which is very surprising because I, I think there was a recent report out there that came out that, according to Beth, she says it's not true. That Beth Korea, she actually completed her UFC contract in the sense that she completed all her fights. And now Beth Korea, she has one last, I think she signed a brand new contract and the new contract is a one fight UFC contract. So yeah, so she, I don't think she was released. I think she, uh, she accomplished her contract. She finished up all her fights and then she was called on to go fight one more time. And it was a one fight contract she's giving, she's being given, and she's gonna be fighting against Yunan Mu, and that'll be on October. So yeah, uh, I'm happy for Beth. Hopefully she wins her last fights. That'll be good for her, but hopefully, you know, yeah, you wanna end off your, your career holding your arms up in the air. Or else you'd be like Daniel Cormier and just be upset and just like regret it for the rest of his career. Uh, so, uh, Shane Dobson, excited. <laughs> Shane Dobson talking about how it was the biggest UFC ups- upset ever. I think she's like a, pl- I think she's like a plus eight hundred underdog in that fight. Yeah, and so I talked about Claudia Cadella in this podcast. So Claudia Cadella was supposed to fight against Yan Chinan, and now we're not sure who is going to place Claudia Cadella at this very moment. But yeah, she, uh, she got pulled out of the fight against Yan. They might just reschedule that fight for a November show. That could happen. So after surgery and stuff, Jessica is looking for help. Let's, uh, also, um, Dana White is offering a possible title fight for our, for Irene Aldena if she defeats Holly Holm. So this is coming in by BloodyElbow.com. After a gallbladder surgery and staff, 
disguised looking for help to get her career back on track. Uh, so, it sounds like the last few months have really taken a toll on former flight attendant Talcum Tanner Jessica I after a rough early UFC run in the women's bantamweight division. I reinvented herself back down to flyweight. However, in the background of those last few bouts, Jessica I was apparently dealing with other major life struggles. Intermittent abdominal pain, lightheadedness, and even occasional vision problems have plagued the former strong style fighter over the past year. So, on August 12th, Okay, so she missed weight on each of her last two bouts, and eventually this guy says the pain became too much to take, so I checked herself into the hospital, where she found that her gallbladder had to be removed. What's more, she suffered a case of staph following the surgery. On August 12th, I had my gallbladder removed because of my lack of function and ability to save the destroyed organ due to doctor's orders. This guy I wrote on her recent experiences, I have yet to fully recover and figure out this new body I'm living in. Not to mention, I got staph in my belly button due to laparoscopic surgery and finally finishing antibiotics for that and coming off antibiotics and struggling hard to regain her appetite and the kind of physical activity that being a pro athlete requires i has turned to social media looking for possible next steps and solutions to her ailment to her ailments in a lengthy post on twitter she detailed her recent struggles in a hope to find some good advice it now September 1 and I am in need of help. I explained, I am not sure where to turn right now with what to do next in my life. I feel the doctors took out my organ and just said, figure it out. I am struggling deeply to eat, feel good and get back to any type of physical activity. I don't know what to do anymore and feel I am inadequate to get myself through this and be able to return to normal life and the octagon. If anyone can point me in the direction to get help, I am begging. I just don't know what to do now. I don't want to just give up. This coming in by this guy's Twitter. Hopefully, this guy can get some good advice. So yeah, uh, yeah. So just because I Twitter says, "Dear help," and this long like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's like a nine paragraph essay about herself and what she what she's going through. Yikes! See, Sally, I can't relate to this. I've never had got gallbladder infection or a staph infection. Uh, just guy, her, yeah, her 2021 has it all the well. She was at one point ranked number two, and she was gonna be fighting against Valentina, but then, like, her, she had a bad series of losses and performances that led to her dropping down. So, yeah, uh, well, that's really upsetting. <laughs> that's really something for just guy. Only thing I can say right now, I don't know, I don't actually know just guy in person, but I always want to see the very best in people. I always want to see, People improve and become better. Uh, actually, in the year of 2020, I've been very active in my church right now, and I'm always doing my best to go interact and talk to everybody and stuff, and try to make everyone as good as they can. 2020 is a very, very tough year to be morally happy. That's that's why last week, last week I had a really tough time even doing, doing the podcast because the year of 2020 and personal stuff that's happening in my life really took a toll on me. And the best thing that just guy can do right now is take a year off. I know, I don't know if she can afford it, but take a year off, chill, relax. If she can't afford to go take the year off, I don't know what to do. I really don't know what she can do right now. Um, I'm not sure. Hopefully things can get good for Jessica I and we can go see the best version of her back in the octagon and she can be a little more positive in life. That's the only thing I can expect. And so, it is announced that Carla Sparza will be fighting its Amanda Reboss for UFC 256. Wow, that is interesting. Okay, so Amanda Reboss is outside the top 12 in the rankings right now in the UFC strawweight division. Carlos Barza cannot cut a break. <laughs> so, okay, I will not be surprised if Esparza, when she does retire from the UFC or when her contract is done in the UFC, I can see it. Where she's gonna cut the same like shtick that she that other fights have been saying. Where if okay, if you are a gatekeeper in any of the women's divisions, there's just no way you can get a title fight unless you're either really young or a prospect or have not been phased out through being shown too much in too many fights. Okay? Good job for Carlos Barza man. She will be fighting three times in the year of twenty twenty. She is making that money good on her. But I really believe that the UFC brass don't really want to push Carlos Parza anywhere near the title scene. I don't say, and it's understandable as to why 
Carlos Barza is this wrestler. And then on the top of the division, we got Rose Nami Yunus. We have, <laughs> we have Yuana Chechek. We got, even though Yuana Chechek, Yuana defeated Carlos Sparza, you still don't want to see those two fight again. We got Wei Zhang. It is, there's a lot of fun fighters in the top of the women's right division who can all pull out fight of the year candidates. And then there's Carlos Sparza, who is just agreed upon by all fans is a boring fighter and it's not fun to watch her. And it was hard to watch her in her last fight because she fought very recklessly. So she's stuck in this weird zone where if she fights good, she fights very boring. But you don't want to see her fight good because it gets boring. But her fighting good is the right way to fight. And she'll be fighting against a prospect in a man rebus. I think it is way too soon for somebody like a man rebus to fight somebody as good as Carlos Sparza. I think it is way too soon for rebus. I think rebus has to go fight a couple more people. But if rebus were to fight against Carlos Sparza, Esparza, she's, you know, barely in the top 10 and rebus gets jump, gets in the front line. They would like to really push her. Amanda Rivas is also a very, a very exciting fighter who you could imagine having really fun action, really fun fights against fighters who are in the, who are in the top five of the women's strike right division. But yeah, Carla Sparza, man, she can't cut a break. She can't cut a break. I still remember, like, her and Claudia Cadella, they both can't cut a break. So Claudia Cadella and Yan Shanan, their fight has been moved to November 7. Good on them for that, but yeah. I agree with many people. If you are outside the top five of the women's right division, being able to get in the top five is just ridiculous. It's absolute ridiculous. And I don't know what Carlos Barza can do in order to go regain her title. I have no clue. I guess Carlos Barza, she has to finish Reboss, which is very unlikely and ha- unhappening. Very, very unlikely. I can expect Kala Sparza to fight even more recklessly in this matchup here because I think it's very pressured on her to have this like exciting performance. But yeah, that's gonna be coming up on UFC which one again? On UFC fifty six in December. Huh. So we got that to expect. Uh as far as uh maybe you have to go on like a five fight winning streak. You gotta defeat Reboss and maybe two people. And then the UFC brass will consider you competing in the top five and fighting against these exciting fighters with your wrestling style. I don't know what's next for you. I really don't. And that brings us to a close for today's podcast. You have been a great, great audience today. Don't forget to wash your hands. Stay safe out there. Hopefully the rest of your day is going to go well. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the GSMC Women's MMA Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask you, please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Women's Mixed Martial Arts Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program